Welcome everyone to our webinar. My name is Bronson and I'm here with Bree and then also online we have Courtney. Uh, Bree and Courtney will be the ones that are kind of doing this whole webinar. I'm just going to be here to facilitate, kind of grease the wheels just a little bit if as needed. But um, I want to introduce uh, Bree and kind of take, take it over to you and say what, how long have you been at Award Co and uh, what's your favorite thing about being here? Yeah, thank you. I've been with Award Co for a little over two years now. Um, I would say my very favorite thing about being at Award Co is hands down my coworkers. Um, I, I wish, I mean, I'll also second that with, uh, you know, feeling like we're actually making a difference in the day-to-day -day work yeah. life of employees. So Yeah, awesome. Thank yeah. you. And uh, Courtney, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? We'll ha kind of go through um, your background in a, in a slide or two, but um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Foley. I'm the director of HR for our retail population over at Vineyard Vines. I've been with the crew here for about seven years um, and have enjoyed every minute of it. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And, and remind us where you're calling in from. Are you in Virginia right now? No, Stanford, Connecticut. Stanford, Connecticut. Beautiful. Connecticut. Yeah, we're on opposite sides of the country right now. We're here in Utah, as you might be able to see with the mountains in the background. But we're excited to have you here, Courtney. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to jump right into it and move on here and talk about what is this webinar about. It's about the employee journey, how employee milestones and holiday celebrations and recognition can address burnout. And both Bree and Courtney have incredible insights into this and to what current clients are doing or what people are doing, what Vineyard Vines is doing, and uh, what, how that has helped their employee base kind of address this burnout situation. So we're going to kind of dive into that a little bit. We already introduced our speakers, Bree and Courtney. Thank you again for being here. And then we'll just kind of dive in and kind of move on to our slide here about anxiety. So there's a lot of anxiety in the world right now, like multiple different issues. But I wonder both uh, Bree and Courtney, if you could speak to that. Courtney, if we'll kind of toss it to you first and just talk about some of the anxiety your employees are seeing and uh, how you're dealing with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think it's twofold for us, right? We have a retail population and we also have a corporate population. Um, but just this past week, I'm sure everyone saw, you know, the U.S. Prevention Services Task Force um, recommended anxiety and depression screenings for adults and mental health um, concerns among Americans. And it's really on the rise. And I think, you know, it's impacting everyone a little bit differently. Um, but overall, people are stressed and anxious right now simply based on the state of the world that we live in. So um, providing a space um, in the work environment where they feel comfortable, secure, appreciated, uh, really kind of has been really important for us to focus on uh, because anxiety is huge here um, and so it's just how we deal with it and how we move forward. Absolutely. I love that you said that it's here and that we just need to deal with it because it's absolutely everywhere. And Bree, I wonder if you've seen that in some of the people that you've been speaking with and with Award Co or even in employees here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love echoing that, that you address <laughs> the elephant in the room, right? It's not so much of an elephant in the room. We need to talk about it. Um, it, it there are crazy times happening. There's a lot of unprecedented things that are going on and I, I think you know, from an entry level employee to a C-suite executive, everyone's feeling different kinds of stress. These C-suite and especially HR executives are trying to address the anxiety they have, which is making them anxious because they <laughs> want to provide a good experience for their employees at work. Employers are wondering, am I going to have a job with this recession? Is this actually going to be something that yeah. um, I can really count on? And so um, definitely there's a lot of concerns, but there's tons of solutions as well to anxiety and how we can tackle that. Yeah, thank you. I, that's what we're going to talk about today is those solutions. And I appreciate you bringing that up because, Courtney, I know you're coming with a bunch of solutions and Bree, you have a bunch as well. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you're both going to say <laughs> about that. So with the anxiety, there's also a lot of burnout happening. And uh, Courtney, I wonder if in your experience, both with Vineyard Vines and elsewhere, outside of that, if you've seen um, symptoms of that anxiety in the form of burnout. And what does that look like? I mean, I think all of us, all of you here on this webinar, HR leaders, you deal with this on the daily, but I think it can be helpful to address what does burnout look like? We have a definition here on slide six of burnout. It's a loss of motivation caused by overwork, frustration, anxiety. I think that might be an oversimplification of burnout. Yeah, yeah. But Courtney, I wonder if you might want to address anything about burnout and how you've seen that in your organization and what you're doing to address that, some small things. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a couple of things, um, you know, right now, 
Um, and over the course of the last few years, uh, burnout has really been magnified. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, with more employees working from home, uh, it means longer hours, trying to produce more work, show their work, and also really leading to lack of engagement by their managers, which kind of only in turn um, causes them to lose that sense of purpose. So for us, um, being really connected and encouraging our managers to be connected with their employees has been incredibly important. Transparency has been our word of the year uh, and making sure that, you know, I think people are being transparent in what they need and their managers also being really transparent with them of what their expectations are, especially if there is this remote atmosphere that we're working in still. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, the working from home seems to have increased burnout when I think before 2020, it might have been like, yeah, great, work from home, less Nine burnout. Five. Yeah, yeah, have you experienced that as well, like in your personal life or with oh, people yeah. you've been speaking with? Absolutely, I think, I don't think there's one person that could honestly say, I'm, ex I'm not exhausted <laughs> or I haven't experienced burnout. Um, I think the trend, you're exactly right, the trend that we're seeing now is the always on the clock mentality. Yeah. We always want to be top performers because of that anxiety, right? Our performance is fueled by anxiety, which definitely is something that we want to try and switch around to create a more healthy work-life balance um, and a relationship with work. But absolutely, I think that burnout is, it's very relevant, it's a very relevant topic today. Yeah. And this stat here about that approximately 70% of employees mm -hmm. feel that their employers are not doing enough to prevent or alleviate burnout within their organization. That's mm -hmm. from a Deloitte study. And uh, this is part of the slides. You'll get these slides after and you can see that link. But the, the biggest drivers of this burnout include a lack of support or recognition from leadership. And recognition can take so many forms. That's what we're going to talk a lot about today. Yeah. But what are some forms of recognition, Brie, that you've seen that have helped ad address some of the burnout that you've been seeing in, in the organizations you work with every day? Yeah, I actually, if I could use an example from just two quarters ago, yeah. um, I'll never forget how meaningful it was when my manager, you know, at the end of an exhausting quarter, we all feel that, I know for a lot of HR leaders right now, open enrollment is occurring. You're yeah. trying to get budgets all situated for 2023. Um, we were going through our similar end of the quarter challenges and we were just all wiped. And I'll never <laughs> forget, my manager, he messaged us all and he said, I want to thank you for an incredibly good job this quarter. Please do not show up to work tomorrow. Uh. And I had never been told that before, <laughs> to not come to work. And he said, take a day off. I want you to, you know, this is a, a token of my appreciation to you. Um, and so I think, you know, that, that, uh, example really exemplifies managers showing appreciation also you know respecting your employees time the things that they do contribute to the organization yeah. understanding that you don't always need to have this always on the clock mentality to have productive to have a productive workforce yeah I think as Americans we're particularly susceptible to oh, that right absolutely. Like, yeah it's weird we're always <laughs> we're always working but we we have the same output yeah you know? yep. that's, that's interesting Courtney I know we spoke earlier um, about something that you wanted to address here about how the pandemic has only enhanced burnout. Um, I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit. And I know that the pandemic is, it's sort of old news, right? Like mm -hmm. two years ago, um, but it's still happening in a lot of ways and it's going to be impacting our lives both personally and professionally for quite a while. I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit and your thoughts about how it has enhanced burnout in organizations. Yeah, I mean, we're, the pandemic is, it is, and has been and continues to be relevant. I yeah. think people are dealing with like post, post pandemic um, issues. And, you know, that being said, one of the things that I was thinking about actually when Brie was just talking was um, providing trust in your employees. Um, because when I was saying before, you know, the enhanced burnout with um, longer hours, working on weekends, um, trying to produce more work to show that you're relevant and to show that you're working when you're at home. I think one of the things for us at Vineyard Vines is the trust that our organization provides in us to be able to effectively and efficiently do our work from home. And now that we're back in the building three days a week, they're able to see it. And, and of course, but the last two years really has been just that trust and making sure that, again, there is that transparency that the organization does have trust in us being able to do our work. So um, I just, I thought that that was interesting, Brie, because we've had that happen to us a couple of times here um, where they've been like, you know what, you guys are doing great. Like take some time for yourself. And with that, it 
it was a retention play for me 100% because it was like, oh, well, they believe in what I'm doing. They believe yeah. that, you know, I, I am doing the work that I need to be doing when I need to be doing it. So Something, Courtney, you just sparked a thought. I know at the very beginning of this, you said transparency has been a huge goal at Vineyard Vines for, you know, this year. It's, it's one of your core values. And I think that I always tend to trust leaders more when they're transparent in the things that I need to improve on and the things yeah. I'm doing well in, right? I know that when they say take Friday off, it's not me saying like, well, I should just clock in just in case. <laughs> because I know if I shouldn't take Friday off, they're going to let me know, right? And so yeah. I think being transparent in both ways to recognize the good, to have mentors who are willing to openly communicate with you and, and really guide you to the next step of your professional career. Yeah, and though mentors like that, they can help alleviate that 70%, right? Because Absolutely. like 70% of employees feel that their employees aren't doing enough. It's just yeah. a personal thing. Like you mentioned, Courtney, it's just reaching out to people and telling them that they're doing good, they're doing well, you yeah. know, like it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that anxiety is, is really, really high just in a lot of ways. Yeah. So then this stat on slide uh, eight is 21% of respondents say their company does not offer any programs or initiatives. So we talked about how employees feel about it. Mm -hmm. And then employees also say, well, they're, they're not offering any program or initiative to prevent or alleviate burnout. Now, like with any kind of survey, there's obviously a little bit of leeway. Companies might be offering something, but the employee might not know about it. Yeah. But um, Courtney, I wonder if you might uh, illuminate us to what you've done at Vineyard Vines over the last, uh, as you're, at your tenure there. How have you helped address this burnout and what have you done to help your employees feel supported? Yeah, so that 20% number actually wasn't at all surprising to me. And I think that, Robin, you're totally right in the aspect that um, employees might not even know that there is some sort of recognition program there or yeah. um, that the company is trying to help them. And so that being said, one of the things that we did a few years back was we did a huge full survey. Um, and we actually built our goals off of that engagement survey um, for the remainder of the year. Um, so timing was perfect. It was right in March. It allowed us to um, create some really attainable actions, but identifying what the things are that your employees are seeing. So for example, in this 21%, the employees may have absolutely no idea. So maybe it's something that you need to market that better. Maybe it's something that you need to get your executive leaders behind. Um, so I would say if, and if you have the resources, and really, you could also do Survey Monkey if it's a smaller organization. Um, yeah. Just hear what your employees have to say, um, because you can assume as much as you can, but until you hear it from them, you really, it's an assumption. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Bri, as you've been talking to organizations about recognition and what they're currently doing, do you feel like this stat is true? Do you feel oh, like yeah. that organizations either aren't doing anything or, mm -hmm. or they are, but they're just not doing enough? What are, what are some of the people you're talking to? What are, what are they doing or how, what's your perception on that? Yeah, it's such a, it really is a strange pendulum where there are some companies that do nothing at all mm. and they think that that's fine, right? We were talking about this earlier, like this, <laughs> yeah. you take your paycheck home and, and that's what you get from work mentality, which times have really changed from that. Um, or, you know, people come with tons of ideas, but being an HR director, you're not necessarily hired to run all of the events, oh, yeah. right? At your organization, you're, you're hired to do completely different nuanced tasks. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're looking for solutions as to how they can actually provide proper execution on those things. Yeah. I think, um, I think Richard Branson may have said something, something like this quote. It goes, um, if you take care of your employees, then they're going to take care of your business. And so I think if we're talking about like, what's the return on that investment, you're yeah. going to see increased productivity and people are going to be more aware that they're going to, it's going to hike uh, or spike loyalty yeah. within your company, right? They, they see you taking care of them. They want to take care of the company in return. I love what you said about loyalty because loyalty often is viewed as a one way street, right? right? Your employees are loyal to you as, to you as the organization. But loyalty can go the other way as well. Mm -hmm. And when it does, then it engenders loyalty the reverse, right? So yeah. that's a complicated way of saying when you're nice to somebody and you treat them yeah. well, they're going to be the same back to you. The golden rule. Golden rule. Right, the yeah. golden rule. Absolutely. It's not too complicated. Yeah. We're taught it, you know, we've really deviated and made it much harder than it needs to be. <laughs> True. So like, like you talked about, Bree, and like you've talked about, Courtney, there are many solutions that we can talk mm -hmm. about. 
And we're gonna we're gonna dive into these. And I know that you have expertise, Pri and Courtney. You have you bring so much to the table that we want to learn from. But we're gonna focus as we've kind of highlighted the problem. Now we've all we know that there's burnout. We know that there's anxiety. What can we do? Well, we can focus on the employee journey. So, in your mind, Courtney, what what is the employee journey for you as as an HR director at Vineyard Vines? What are some of the key touch points of the employee journey, and what do you focus on? to help employees feel connected. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think however the journey, um, identifying the roadmap or the stairway or whatever it is that you use, um, ensuring really consistency within the process. Bree and I talked about this yesterday, um, identifying a process that is going to work within your organization um, that you can remain consistent with um, is only going to benefit. Um, we start soup to nuts. It starts with the recruiting all the way to that last exit survey um, and how in touch are we. So, uh, you know, from the first we conduct 30, 60, 90 day check-ins, whether it be a survey that we provide or it's a one-on-one -on -one touch point. Um, we do regular engagement surveys, like I said, transparency and communication and expectations, um, celebrating milestones, anniversaries, um, birthdays, projects and initiatives, and celebrating those, and really whatever it is that the roadmap looks like, um, employees are only going to be more understanding of the organization and the culture and really be happier in turn. Because if they can understand the path then, and they can understand the process, then it's going to be more clear for them. I think where people get hung up is the gray. So if you, if you provide gray atmosphere, people are going to be like, I'm just confused. Yeah, absolutely. I'm reminded of that uh, if people anticipate, just what you were saying about that, Courtney, if people have something to anticipate, even if it's an it's a employee journey, right? I know I'm going to get something here for a service milestone, and then there's a holiday party or whatever it might be. That anticipation can be just as beneficial as the actual event. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really interesting that you say that because transparency and communication, letting, getting rid of that gray area, yeah. so huge, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say for the most part, people crave variety, right? Yeah, we yeah. need to know that we're actually moving towards something. We're yeah. goal-driven, oriented people, I think, just naturally, intrinsically. So. Yeah, definitely. And so we're going to focus on the employee journey and how, what we define the employee journey as is a five-step process. But generally, the employee journey consists of celebrating milestones while supporting employees on a personal level every day. So the employee journey, depending on who you talk to, I, you know, Courtney, I know you might have a different definition of Vineyard Vines employee journey um, than, than we do here at Awardco and some of the organizations you work with, Bree, probably have a different one. But for this, we're going to focus on five key steps that most everybody has uh, in, as part of their employee journey. I know that I've read seven-step employee journeys yeah. or nine or, you know, whatever it might be. So. Keep it short. Yeah. Simple. To we'll the keep point. it short. <laughs> so with step one, we're going to talk about recruiting. And fantastic recruiting here on slide 12 is about a journey of milestones. Bree, I wonder if you have any thoughts about some of the milestones that are part of recruiting, um, whether you've experienced them here before you came to AwardCo or elsewhere, or how you're helping organizations develop really great recruiting milestones. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Now, I'm not the marketing professional. This is your area of expertise, but recruiting begins, you know, the second that they put, like, click on your landing page. Um, your, your materials that you put out there says so much about your organization, the effort that you put into um, recruiting top talent. I think one of the biggest things that really sticks out to me in the recruiting process is how communicative you are to the applicant. One thing that I love that our recruiting team does here at Award Co. is when you come in for an interview, you're going to get a handwritten thank you note. Um, just for thanking you for being a part of the recruiting process, for considering us in, in your um, you know, long hunt for employment, which really is... It can be stressful, right? Yeah, yeah. completely stressful. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, being intentional on what the process, again, Courtney, and I love that, the process <laughs> looks like really can make a huge lasting impact on the applicants that will come through your front door. Yeah, communication is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. Courtney, uh, with Vineyard Vines, when you, when you got to Vineyard Vines, was there an onboarding process and, uh, or a recruiting process, and what did that look like, and have you changed it since you, you joined Vineyard Vines? 
Yeah, so actually very interesting. When I first joined Vineyard Vines, I was our field recruiter. So that was my job. I was the first one to, to be doing it. Um, at that point, we had fewer, much fewer stores than we do today. Um, and so the process had to be built from the ground up. I think, you know, we utilize LinkedIn as a way to connect with people and as a way to passively source. Um, and since then, I think Bree is totally right. It starts with what are you showing to people who aren't even necessarily directly applying or interested in applying? Um, and how are you presenting yourself and your organization um, through those social media accounts? So um, our page has consistently grown double digits as far as followers go. Um, we are posting at least once a week. Um, and then also, too, obviously, since I oversee our field population, it is um, consistently getting the word out there. And I know we're going to talk about referrals, which is like I'm huge on, um, but that's one of the best ways to get people in, especially with this great resignation that we're coming out of. Um, you know, I think the word of mouth um, has been a huge player for us, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like that you mentioned that because I wanted to ask you both, as we see here on this slide, that 45% of referred employees stay for more than four years. But um, with, with that in mind, that referred employees stay longer, outside of referring employees, what are some ways that companies can get the word out there and help with recruiting beyond just digital? Because everything right now is very digital. AwardCo is a digital company, yeah. right? We're very tech. We, we recruit with the internet. But, um, you know, Courtney, you, you uh, have a lot of retail space that you need to fill. And I wonder, what does that look like for you? Is it mostly referral based? And how do you manage that? And how do you make sure that you're getting a, a good pool of employees? Yeah, so hands down, it, employee referrals are the most cost-effective way to find talent, especially in a retail space. Um, we are lucky. Our network is in our mall um, and really close to us. So um, getting to know the neighbors and just having networking conversations. Um, great talent surrounds themselves with great talent. So um, identifying how to incentivize those um, individuals to drive their network into the ATS, you're only going to be setting yourself up to be more successful. So um, I think first and foremost, foremost, and I know you didn't note this, Bronson, but uh, making sure that the employees are having a positive experience firsthand is the best way to get a referral through the door. Um, so take care of people that are within your four walls. Um, second, I would be, I would say, consistency and spreading the word. Um, so we talk about referral referral process within um, the first 30, 60, 90 day touch points that we're having them with them. Whether it's in a survey, we're saying, hey, do you have anyone that you would like to refer? Or it's that one-on-one -on -one conversation, hey, do you know anyone in the center who we should go and chat with? Um, we also share open biweekly or um, open roles biweekly uh, with our entire population. Our corporate sees what's going on in the stores. Our stores see what's going on in corporate because obviously, like I said, great talent surrounds themselves with great talent. Um, and then also, I, I know it's digital, but we provide our teams with recruiting assets. So we provide our store managers to post on behalf of the organization. But at the same time, we're providing new hires with, with assets as well to share that they've joined the Vineyard Vines family. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, those are, sorry, that was a lot. Of no, that's great. That's what we're here for. <laughs> and I love that you mentioned all that because I wonder, Courtney, are you seeing a a boost in retention because of the, the referrals that you're doing and all that effort you're putting into, you know, surrounding yourself with good talent like that? A hundred percent. We, uh, like many other organizations, had to pause a referral bonus program um, during COVID and we kicked it off again end of last year, so the same time last year. And we have seen um, less turn, more people coming through our doors, better talent coming through our doors. So it's a, it's a really good investment um, that we've made. Ah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I have a quick question for you, Bree. Yeah. How did you, were you a referral for Award Cup? Absolutely. Were you really? I sure was, <laughs> I, was yeah. I did not know that beforehand. <laughs> I'm not just like trying I to did. see that. I did, yeah, I was a referral, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I really think that when you have people at work that you trust and rely on, it makes it so much easier to be integrated into a new workplace. Going to work is like, of starting a new job is really scary. I don't care how old you are, yeah. how much career experience you have. It's nerve-wracking, sure. right? For yeah. Um, so yeah, I was a referral and I've been here for two plus years. There you go, right? So. You're, you're on your way to the fourth. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question for both of you, Courtney and Bree. What, um, sorry, 
bump that. OK, so we're still on slide 13 here. How do you increase employee referrals if there is kind of a low sense of engagement overall? Because mm -hmm. employees will give referrals if they're really excited about where they work. Yeah. But what if there's kind of a sense of like, well, yeah, I, it's a job. I'm here. How do you get great referrals out of uh, low company morale or something like that, or, or a department that has kind of low morale? Mm. What do you think, Bree? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think, so kind of going back to the recruiting uh, process, you know, there was a little bullet point that was like pre and post interview care. Mm -hmm. um, I think that taking care of your employees internally and building morale internally, giving your employees who are already there something to look forward to and something to be proud of, that's going to really ignite excitement among them. And so when we talk about like, well, what are some incentives that we can offer around, um, you know, referral bonuses? Maybe it is a hundred dollar gift card. Maybe it's a hundred dollar bonus on their next check. Or maybe it's something as, this is just off the top of my head, putting their face with a little bio, you know, <laughs> as you walk in on the monitor and you, can, you get to learn everything about Bronson and the person that he just brought onto the team, right? A little ideas like that can go a long way and you can do it with an organization that really is as small as 30 employees. I know that's a huge thing in the small market space where I've met recruiters that um, also do payroll, right? Sometimes oh, with yeah. those smaller organizations, you're really spread thin. But there's a lot that you can do with a little budget. Mm -hmm. You just need a little creativity to spark excitement in your internal workforce currently. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It's a good idea to put those little, like a little yeah. bubble or something. I don't know if I'd love my face being blown. That's just an example. But <laughs> some people might, though, yeah, right? Some yeah, some people would, yeah. People Courtney, like talking. Uh, Courtney, I wonder if uh, you might add anything to that. How would you increase referrals if there's a little bit of maybe hesitation or... Uh, low enthusiasm about it. Yeah, so luckily within our retail population, our managers, if they're, if, like I said, if their four walls aren't intact, then they're not being successful. So if they don't have people um, to come in and work, then we have an issue, right? So there is an accountability towards managers for providing a space that people want to work and also providing, um, you know, some leverage for those people to be coming in. So again, it's a reflection of, you know, if something's not working here and morale is down, what is it that we can be doing to change morale? Um, is morale down because of company initiatives that are kind of outside of our control, or is morale down because it's a reflection of myself and my leadership? Um, and, you know, if that is the case, obviously there's opportunity to shift. But I think, you know, some of the things that we've found to be successful are those, like, small incremental dollars um, to send their way because – having our recruiter recruit for a sales associate or a assistant manager is going to be way more expensive um, than, you know, having just a hundred dollar gift card or whatever it is. Um, oh. we've done other things like sweetening the pot. So it's, you know, I get some, you get some. So if I referred Bree, um, I get $200, Bree would get $200. So um, it's a way to act as a sign on bonus. Um, and then we've also doubled down with our rewards program. So during key times of the year, we're incentivizing them to bring additional people in and then we'll give them double the money um, just because it is that valuable to us. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. There are a number of things you touched on there that we'll go over briefly and then we'll move on. But I like that you said some of the things are out of your control. Like we've been talking about the anxiety and kind of the burnout that's going on. We're talking about what we can control within that scope. but. Sometimes there's stuff you can't control, like we can't yeah. control inflation, we yep. can't control gas prices or whatever might be causing a lot of anxiety, and those are very real things. Mm -hmm. So we can only focus on what we can control, which might be something like making sure people feel valued, uh, making sure people feel like they have a friend at work or if they're referred or something like that. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that, Courtney and Bree. Thank you. So that's step one, just to kind of review. Step one is just great recruiting. Uh, make sure that you have a good process in place like you both have spoken about. Step two, we talk about unbeatable onboarding and timely celebrations. Um, talking about unbeatable onboarding, Brie, you were sharing with me a, a section of a book that you're reading. I wonder if yeah. you might bring that up because it was really great. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, a book called The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath. I read this book um, 
several years ago, I was telling Bronson, I actually don't really love business books. <laughs> They're just not my cup of tea, but this book's really great, so I highly recommend. Um, but there's a section in there that talks about John Deere's recruiting, or excuse me, onboarding process. And uh, it, it begins right after they accept that offer letter. The second they do that, they get an email letting them know step-by-step -step detailed what they can expect on their first day, where to park, who's going to greet you, um, who's going to walk you to your desk. It minimizes confusion and gets them excited for their first day because your nerves are a little bit eliminated, oh, yeah. right? You get That's to just true. focus on the good stuff because you have a list. Um, <laughs> when they walk through the front door, you know, there's on that TV screen, you know, a picture of them or, or their name that says, you know, welcome Bronson to John Deere. They then go to their desk and on their monitor is a video from the CEO and a letter that says, you know, this is the, the greatest work you'll ever do or something really, really sweet like that. They get to watch the video right after some, you know, onboarding of culture. So not onboarding and like, these are the rules you have to follow. That comes later. <laughs> but the first impression is, this is what makes it so great. These are the things that you can expect here. Mm. This is what we do for Christmas. This is what you'll get when your one year anniversary. After that, they get taken to lunch, right? With different people from different teams. Yeah. Um, so they get to meet a little bit of everybody in the organization. That really stood out to me. You know, I, I love the title of the book, The Power of Moments. Yeah. There are so many things that go uncelebrated. We shouldn't just focus on employees doing well at, you know, their one year anniversary or even five year anniversary. A lot of people won't make it there. Yeah. So day one is such a crucial part to that onboarding experience. It'll leave a lasting impression. And they're just little things, right? Yeah. It took two seconds to write up, you know, welcome Bronson to John Deere. Yeah. Two seconds. And it probably is something that, you know, he would think about for forever, right? Yep. Yeah, that's true. And I, a lot of times that's, that's the pinnacle of like an employee onboarding oh, experience, yeah. right? Um, when I was hired at Awardco a number of years ago, it, I, it was not that. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> I, I remember, like, yeah. Yeah, right? You remember. Like sit down, you're like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, and like people are like, oh. so we only highlight that to say that not every company can can maybe reach John Deere levels of Yeah, of you have to grow, yeah, right? You yeah, you can grow, but it's moments, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, right? Courtney, I wonder, um, what moments are you creating for your employees during the onboarding process that help help those touch points? I know you mentioned that you're talking to them and asking them for referrals, you know, 30, 60, 90 days out. What else are you doing to help with that onboarding to help solidify that feeling of belonging for your employees? Yeah, so when Brie was just talking through like what a first day looks like at John Deere, I was sitting internalizing being like, that's something I would be anxious about. That's something I would be anxious about. Oh, that I wouldn't. So I when I was like thinking about it, there are things and processes, again, processes that you can put in place <laughs> Um, that help alleviate that. So we provide an onboarding packet to anybody who's going to be joining our organization, and it is to be done and conducted by the manager, and it is a robust packet. It has in there, you know, what are your first 30, 60, 90 days going to look like? What are your expectations going to be? We're already putting um, calendar taps on your calendar, so when you come in, you know what you're looking forward to. You also have on there any vendors and contacts that you're going to need for your first 30, 60, 90 days. We're going to put on there any partners that you're going to need to connect with and also when you should be connecting with them um, because, it, again, it helps alleviate some of that anxiety. Um, one of the big things that I had when I came into Vineyard Vines for the first time was, oh, my gosh, what am I going to wear? Um, so yeah. for us, we yeah. provided them with whale bucks, um, and when they jump on board, um, they can go onto our site and purchase some product um, on behalf of the organization just to, you know, make them feel comfortable and confident while they're walking in, walking in the door. Um, you know, we've done happy hours, and when we have been remote, it's been Zoom happy hours. Um, uh, we have done balloons on office chairs to show who the new people are so that when you're walking by, you can stop and wave and introduce yourself. Um, we've also done we have burgies. Obviously, Vineyard Vines is very nautical, but we have little burgies that have been made with years. Um, so when you walk past the desk, you can see, oh, that person joined in 2020. They've been here for two years. So um, there's just lots of little things that, again, it helps alleviate some of the anxiety when you are coming on board and you're and you're the new person. Right? Yeah, creating those moments. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's so funny. You said I didn't know it 
what you'd wear on your first day. I remember yeah. um, I came from a workforce that was very strict in our dress code. So I'm talking like skirts, blazers. And my the person who uh, referred me literally texted me the day before and he was like, do not wear a skirt. <laughs> this is a tech company. <laughs> it's like, don't do it. So, it, yeah. you know, it's nice to have people that'll, that'll guide you Absolutely. in that way. And, uh, Gordon, you bring up an interesting point. Many of our viewers today may not know what Vineyard Vines does. Yeah. So but when you said, um, what was I going to wear? I think, yeah, with Vineyard Vines, what do you wear? Yeah. Because uh, um, if you might explain what Vineyard Vines does so they can kind of understand the context of that. Yeah, absolutely. We are a um, luxury retail apparel company that services men, women, and children. Um, but we lean heavily in the nautical space. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and so like when you're talking about what do I wear on the first day? Yeah, do you Normally wear like people here? don't show up in a suit here. We're yeah. very casual, and um, so a lot of people think that you know when you come in for a first day or an interview, it's the big question mark is if you're wearing a blazer or not. And normally, no. Yeah, yeah. All these tiny little things can help with a great onboarding experience, right? As long as people know about them beforehand. So we'll kind of move forward here to slide six, slide 16. Yeah, 33% of employees quit their jobs within the first six months. This is just to highlight the importance of onboarding. Mm -hmm. When you have those touch points and you have those moments, then you like that's a third of your employee base mm -hmm. that is quitting within the first six months. Now that does vary depending on industry and size and all of those kinds of things. But if you have a great onboarding experience, you can cut down in that quite a bit and you know save a lot of money. You can create a better culture if people aren't leaving you know, I know that that can be really hard. I used to work in an organization where people would leave within the first three to six months. And that made it very difficult as a, a longer tenured employee to be like, yeah, well, it's, people are leaving. What's like, this place is not that great. Yeah. You know, it can really affect morale. Yeah. yeah. So just to, as a refresher, the first step of an employee journey is great recruiting. The second one is unbeatable onboarding and kind of those touch points, those moments like we talked about. And then step three, like we can see here, is intentional career development. Now again, these steps are just ones that we've defined and that we've highlighted and chosen to highlight in this webinar. Yours might be slightly different, but the hope is that you will glean some ideas of what you can do in your organization to make your employee journey better. So with intentional career development, you've gone through the recruiting, you've gotten an employee onboarded, hopefully they're there and you've got a lot of great uh, connections and they feel in and supported. What's the next step? How do you keep them engaged? It's with intentional career development, and that can that can be a number of different things. Um, Courtney, what what kind of career development do, does Vineyard Vines offer, and how does that affect your your employees' journey? Yeah, so you know, I actually have in my notes that career development conversations happen actually in the recruiting process for us. Um, we need to know where you want to go and where how you want to get there and what your timeline looks like. We want to ask those questions and be real with them. Is this going to be the right fit? Do we have that trajectory um, already set up? So that being said, um, you know, once they're onboarded, we are starting to have those um, goal setting conversations. We need to understand really when we're setting those goals, how are we helping them get to where they wanna go? Um, so of course, while we're working towards the larger company goals within those, we should also be tailoring those goals to where that employee sees themselves. Um, the conversation should be a minimum of three times per year, right? Goal setting, mid-year, performance reviews. If you're talking about them in between or every month or how are you working towards your goals, like, that's great. But a minimum for us of three times a year um, is really important. And then in addition, how um, you make these goals achievable. And it's kind of like this choose your own path um, for us. So as managers, we shouldn't really have to handhold the entire way. Um, I think on the slide it says self-service, um, but we've built our advancement path based on our core competencies. So from these core competencies, identifying which are the most important within each path. For us in our stores, it's really easy. It's a pretty, you see the levels um, that you need to get to. Um, so in stores, it, it, it's easier to show growth through competencies because the path is clear. But by being transparent on exactly what we need to see from them in order for them to be considered for future opportunities is a self-serving way um, for them to determine if they're ready for next. So then they should be able to say, you know what, Bree, I'm ready. I've, I've, I've executed X, Y, and Z competencies, and then I've also added on this and that um, and be able to kind of present it back to you. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Um, question about that, Courtney. You said that you have three 
three meetings or three touch points throughout the year to kind of discuss personal development. Well, how did you land on that number and what, what made you decide to go with three and what, what's the interval that you have in between those? Yeah, so our goal setting will typically happen somewhere between March and April. Um, our performance, our mid-year conversations are actually happening right now. We're right in the thick of it. Um, and then our performance review conversations will happen sometime between January and February. Um, while it's a little bit more condensed in the beginning of the year, um, we identify the three just, just so that you can see um, if you're making strides or not. Um, if you're talking about goals every single month, um, it might get a little diluted just because you might not have seen um, the success that you've wanted to see within that. So for us, it's really, what is it, once a quarter, once every probably six months, um, are you seeing the, the results that you really wanted to see in order for you to get to next? Yeah. I, I really love that because that's something I know a lot of organizations struggle with yeah. is uh, just laying that out for employees right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And with some of the organizations you've talked to, Bree, have you experienced that as well? And what are, what are they doing to help with career development? Yeah, there's actually, uh, as you were talking, Courtney, I was reminded of a contact that, you know, this person I was in contact with for a little while. And she had mentioned one of the issues with turnover was the lack of you know, change management, career development. Mm. And um, one of her top performers was leaving and they, they really appreciated this person, would have moved mountains to get him to stay. But they asked, you know, why are you leaving? And he said, well, my life circumstances, this was in November when he left, my life circumstances are much different than they were in January and I'm not getting what I need out of this job anymore. And her jaw just dropped because she was like, I didn't know, yeah. right? There was just, there again, communication. There was no communication and checking in on the employees. Is this still working for you? It's, in my opinion, not always the employee's responsibility to consistently check in with management, yeah. right? It should be, I think that good leaders expect you to move on. Good leaders want you to grow within your organization. They want you to get the maximum amount possible out of your company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, anyway, you know, that was just like a huge thing that I saw. I was like, well, we need to be intentional. Our managers need to be trained well to do those um, routine check-ins. I'm, you know, I'm sure that your management at Vineyard Vines just knows, right, Courtney, that <laughs> this is the time that we're doing this. You know, quarterly reviews are in. Um, but other things that I have seen done very effectively are the, it's the, you know, 30, 90, 120 rule of yeah. checking in with your employees, making sure that they're constantly on track, that they're happy, um, talking about their performance as well, right? Good leaders want you to, to succeed. Yeah, and when you do that, as it says here on slide 19, 94% of your employees would stay longer mm -hmm. and you'd have a 34% reduction in turnover. That's from Forbes, yeah. in case any of you are wondering as you're watching here. But that's, that's incredible. 94% of employees surveyed said they would stay longer if they had a yeah. career development trajectory. Mm -hmm. And Courtney, what you mentioned, just having the, that 30, 90, uh, yeah, 30, 60, 90, or what you mentioned, 30, 90, yeah, 120. Yeah, skipped the 60. <laughs> whatever, it, whatever it might be. That can have a huge impact. Just checking in and being and making sure that people feel like they are growing, they're developing, mm -hmm. they have those opportunities to grow as they want to personally. Mm -hmm. Like the story you mentioned, the gentleman said that uh, that doesn't fit with my life circumstances anymore. Mm -hmm. Had they had those touch points, they might have known that yeah, beforehand 100%. and have been able to provide it. Yeah. So we'll continue moving on. We know we're kind of running up against time here a little bit. So we've gone through the three steps. Going to go through four and five here, and then talk about how recognition and helps with all of this and how you can give good, powerful, impactful recognition. So the employee journey step four, lasting retention by addressing burnout. That can be a number of different things, but we want to highlight recognition and appreciation, dynamic rewards, benefits and perks, compensation. Bree, you mentioned that um, as we were talking before the webinar, compensation isn't enough to retain employees. Yeah. You know, and I, Courtney, I'm interested in your thoughts about this too, but I wonder if you would share with me, share with everyone, <laughs> what you shared with me about that, how sometimes leadership might not be as in touch with that as they could be. Yeah, um, the reality is, is we're dealing with different gaps in time mm -hmm. <laughs> at our That's company, true. right? Uh, you've heard the old Gen Z, millennial, boomer era, whatever you want to <laughs> call it. 
um, times have shifted, you know, very drastically. And so some people who might be in executive leadership right now um, might kind of, well, I'll use this just from past experience. You know, people I've worked with, leadership sometimes rolls their eyes at these initiatives because you and I should be grateful to take home just our paycheck. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always correlate though with this always on the clock mentality. Yeah. Um, people, we're seeing trends right now, these Gen Z millennial workforce want to do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think we can all agree, COVID-19 taught us that life is not as long or it's <laughs> not as expected, it's yeah. unusual. Um, you know, we wouldn't have thought that. And so people are searching for always something more wanting to make sure that they're adding value to the place that they're spending the majority of their life at. Yeah, and feeling valued and having meaning in their work. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. Uh, Courtney, what thoughts do you have about how retention can be impacted by recognition and appreciation, dynamic rewards, benefits and perks, or compensation? Yeah, so it's interesting when um, I told you guys a couple of years ago, we did this employee engagement survey and um, one of our questions was, you know, if you were to leave for another opportunity, what would it be? Um, and three out of your four were our top three. Um, and so we kind of took the opportunity to take a step back and say, to Bree's point earlier, we can't do all of this. What are some resources that we can leverage that could help us? Um, Award Co. was one of them as it related to rewards and recognition. Um, we also invested in a compensation tool that allowed us to really look at the market um, but, you know, obviously I understand that those are investments, but, it, but I think what in the core of it is, is taking a step back and listening to what they want um, and trying to check the boxes on how you can make the needle move a little bit. Because again, it's like I said earlier, it's an assumption unless you actually have the facts that support it. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, had, I found it interesting just because we, we feel pretty close. Um, but I think Bree's right. People aren't going to stick it out anymore. They're revisiting what their path is and what they want it to look like and um, what's important to them. Um, they're not afraid to share it either. So if you just ask the question, um, I'm sure you'll get pretty truthful answers. Yeah. yeah. It's communication and transparency, yeah. right? Yeah. So we've gone over... We love and processes. processes. <laughs> Absolutely. Processes are great. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure you have them is a good thing. It takes time, but it'll save you time and money That's true. down the road. That's right? very true. So we've talked about the employee journey in four steps. The fifth step we're not going to highlight too much because it is the last step. It's sort of the exit interview, making sure you get the feedback you need from these leaving employees so you can improve as an organization. We, what we want to highlight, though, is a kind of solution-driven how can we help with the employee journey now? And we've touched on it throughout, like these moments and recognition. And AwardCo is a, a recognition company. We deal with recognition and rewards and how to improve employee engagement through that space. But we want to talk about how to make it impactful. Mm -hmm. and, and Courtney, I know that you have a lot of, of value to add here, but we want to talk about recognition and appreciation in the employee journey. And on this slide here, it says that 40% of employees say they're not recognized enough. This is from HBR, Harvard Business Review. And we've done our own studies with, uh, with a service, uh, with HR.com, where we talked about, where we learned that almost half, well, it was 71% of organizations have a recognition program of some kind. Generally, that's probably service awards or service sure. milestones. But, you know, this correlates with that 40% of employees say they're not recognized enough. So, what is powerful recognition then? Um, Courtney, I wonder if you might speak to that. What, what makes recognition powerful for you or for your employees at Vineyard Vines? Yeah, you know, I think it's being intentional. Um, I think when that statistic comes up, to me, it just shows that I think people, especially in the last few years, get bogged down in the day-to-day -day of what they need to be doing and sometimes you know the thankfulness goes to the wayside um, because you're just trying to get through work um, and so uh, these four points I think are huge but most importantly it is really being intentional and being mindful so if you have a leader who is bought into um, recognition and they understand how their team likes to be recognized when they like to be recognized and they make it in important for them as a leader in turn, it'll only tenfold come back. Um, but I think the, the personal piece for me, um, I think is the most important, um, just because, you know, when you're acknowledging 
um, behaviors. Um, it's so easy to go and acknowledge behaviors that kind of lean negative. So for example, um, you know, staying later or working over the weekend or overworking. And we like, that is like what we're recognizing people for, but recognize them for the things that they're doing great within their existing job. But people yeah. could see that and perceive it as negative and also perceive it as like what their expectations are. And that's not the case at all. So find more reasons and make it really personal for the individual who's receiving it so that they understand and they see that you see them. If that makes sense. Yeah. I love that you said that because that, that has happened to me before where an, another employee was recognized for staying late. And I'm like, oh, man, does that create expectations that in order to be recognized, you have to do that? And that, that can be a lot of, you know, create a lot of anxiety and pressure and, and all sorts of things like that. But I love what you said about making it purposeful and intentional. Um, it doesn't have to be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to know your people and uh, observe, be observant, be present and uh, recognize them for what they're doing, you know? The next, the next thing we can talk about is being genuine with recognition. Um, Brie, you're one of the most genuine people I know. Oh, and I'm, thank you. I'm not just <laughs> so saying nice. that, like, I really think you are. Um, how do you integrate that genuine feeling into recognition when you give it or, or when you receive it? How, do, how does that feel? Yeah, I, uh, you know, if you know me personally, I pretty much get excited about anyone and anything. So I don't know that I'm maybe the best uh, to answer this question, but I guess a template approach. Sometimes being genuine, it, it, it is difficult, um, yeah. especially when you're busy at a workplace. So when I talk to people about how we can create this authenticity um, within your organization, I, I always tell them, think about the who, what, when and why yeah. you know who am I recognizing what did they do um, and you know why was it important and, and that when right making sure going on to the next slide you know was it timely making yeah. sure that it happens um, quickly so I don't know I, I think that there's a lot of good out there in the world there, there's <laughs> a lot that we can really focus on and you know focusing outward can really change our internal processes. Hey, there it is. <laughs> right, <for me. laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate that. So we've gone over how making recognition impactful can be. It needs to be personal, like you shared with us, Courtney. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be timely. Uh, if you recognize someone for something they did months ago, like if you wait until the holiday party to yeah. recognize them, it's not going to be as impactful, right? So it doesn't have to be a big to do right in the moment, but as long as you're recognizing them and saying, thank you for this. I know you did this. It was amazing. Um, that is very important as well. And then recognition needs to be rewarding. Now, when we talk about rewarding, we're talking about a bunch of different things. It needs to be rewarding in the fact of if you're going to reward someone with something, whether that's gift cards or cash or, or extra PTO, it has to be important enough for that person to feel that value. Desirable. Desirable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be really difficult, especially mm -hmm. if you're working with a limited budget. But it doesn't have to be impossible. Uh, rewarding recognition doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, monetary. Yep. Recognition can be rewarding in non-monetary ways. In fact, there are a lot of studies that say that recognition is, has just as much impact when it's non-monetary. Yeah, I think Great Place to Work, they released a survey a couple of years ago, and I think 32% of people that they yeah. polled said they just want a thank you, which says a lot about our current workplace and how we need to improve, but it's also very insightful and should alleviate the stress of like, I can't do this, I don't have a budget. No, you can do this with the small budget you do have, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're kind of breezing through here a little bit. We want to make sure we get to your Q&A before we end here. But we've talked about how to make recognition important through making it personal, genuine, timely, rewarding. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, one of the main ways that uh, people generally have a recognition program is through service awards and holidays. And at the beginning of this webinar, we talked about how celebrating holidays as part of the employee journey can help with burnout. And that's important in a lot of ways because holidays are something that everyone that not everyone celebrates every holiday. Some, most people. Yeah, most people, but it's yeah. a reason to get together. Yeah. It's a reason to celebrate something, to look forward to something, mm -hmm. to have a, a milestone, a touch point where you can engage with your employees, maybe get to know them a little bit more so that you can make recognition more impactful. So um, as we talk about the end of what recognition does, this says gratitude's ROI. This is from a study by Gallup. They determined the actual um, 
benefits of gratitude. Now, gratitude can mean a lot of different things. We Gratitude is often recognition. When you recognize someone, you're often expressing gratitude. So when you do that, there's 3x engagement, 23% profitability, you know, negative 43% turnover, plus 10% customer loyalty, and a whole host of other amazing benefits for just something as simple as a thank you. Yep. Right? It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. So we want to just let you know that the power is in your hands. Recognition and rewards is your most powerful tool in combating burnout. And we want to get some, to some Q&A really quick for questions for Courtney, especially as, as our HR director of, of Vineyard Vines and for Bree. Um, so we'll kinda, we have some questions here we want to get to. Um, one of these questions is there's a big difference between what is possible in the office positions versus production, service in industry, and truckers. What are some effective ways to show appreciation beyond a thank you or a trinket to those not in the offices? Courtney, I, I know that you have a lot of retail workers uh, in your space. How would you answer that question? Yeah, so we, um, I had it noted when we were talking about holidays, so short term, um, we did what's called 12 plays of holidays. It was our big initiative last year. Um, and what we did was we actually kind of broke down what our drivers were. So 33% of um, what we were focused on were individual contributor metrics that we were trying to drive. 33% um, was morale um, and driving team morale, and 33% was um, actually putting our districts against each other. But that being said, when I'm saying that, I'm saying we identified many different areas that of you know what we wanted to do for this population to show them that we're appreciative of them, to show them that you know we want them to achieve their sales goals, to show them that it's a team environment. And I think you know when you do look at an environment um, like what you're talking about it's important to identify what's important to them. Um, and again, what's gonna drive them, not a trinket, maybe it's not money, but if you can break it up in a way that you necessarily can see, um, you know, maybe you break it up in four different ways of these are four ways in which someone could, could feel re uh, rewarded or recognized, um, then I think you'd be better off. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Uh, what programs do you offer to address burnout? Courtney, I'd love to hear your thoughts there, and then Bree, of, of your thoughts of any other organizations you've worked with that have mm -hmm. uh, instituted programs for burnout. Sure. Yeah, so um, as it relates to programs, I'm trying to think. Um, we, I, for some reason, Bree's example of the random day off um, is sticking in my head. Um, hopefully no one on this call works for Vineyard Vines, but we're looking at um, October 10th as being a potential day for us to, to recognize our team um, and provide them that time off. Um, we also um, have a team huddle coming up. Um, and we do them every quarter um, to recognize our team um, and do some fun awards and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'd say those are a couple of things that we do regularly. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any other organizations doing programs specifically to address burnout? Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the biggest ones that comes to mind is a company I was working with established a minimum amount of time that they had to take off. Oh, that's cool. um, so you have your allotted PTO. There's tons of surveys. Do a Google search that says we do not take all of our PTO off. Yep. Um, so take the you have to take a minimum amount. You must do that. And yeah. that seems to bode really well with their employee base. It's true. I've read a lot of studies about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. really interesting. So we have time for one more question here. How do you promote your referral program to ensure engagement? What is the process or the rules? For example, we need the referral form completed prior to us contacting the applicant. Um, so Courtney, I wonder if you might address that. What's uh, that question in particular? Yeah, so how I'm understanding that question is that prior to um, the applicant getting hired on, they must acknowledge that the applicant applied um, due to the referral. Um, we also have like a verification uh, process on the back end of it too, where the store manager will go and input that they had a referral come through. So then it's basically an audit of one another. If one seems off, um, we just ask some more questions. Um, but then as it relates to promoting it, uh, like I said, we talk about it in onboarding. Um, we drill it home anytime we have seasons coming up. Um, we will flex, so we'll uh, offer greater rewards um, during certain amount of times when we need more people. Um, and then we've also offered sign-ons in addition to that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. 
Well, that kind of concludes our, our webinar here. We're about at time. But thank you for attending. Thank you, Bree, for your insights and your, your great knowledge. And thank you as well, Courtney, for everything you've added to this. And uh, we'll get it back to HRE.